and welcome back to my channel. Unless you're new here, and then it's just welcome, yeah? I am Rusty, and I was just distracted by somebody riding by my house at 2.15 in the morning. And no, I'm not going to start over. My name is Rusty, and this is my channel where I talk about my favorite movies, mostly horror, and my favorite music, mostly metal, and welcome to my channel where tonight we are going to be taking a look at or well actually we're just going to be discussing looking for mr good bar you know when i was a kid i used to love eating a mr good bar and that didn't change when i got grown so you take that however you want to <laughs> but we are going to d uh, discuss it. I really love this movie, and I was very, very happy to finally get it. Now, if you remember my uh, Kiss My Boot video, these were the one of the two boots that I had to order because it's not available on Blu-ray in the United States or in Region 1 or Region A. So I had to break down and get a boot of it. Um, it's a 1080p boot, and... Uh, the quality is very good. Uh, like I said in that movie, I had ordered some, and I did not know about this site. We'll talk about that more in the update in which I talk about uh, these things. But yeah, I was very disappointed. I had to wait like five weeks for it, whereas the other from the other people I bought were very beautiful, very good quality um, packaging and video. And then we had to, you know, I had to wait five weeks for this, and I was very upset about that. Granted, I didn't read their facts, but who does? You would usually put something like that on the front page. But it was recommended, this uh, certain sloppy site. And so, yeah, um, we are going to be talking about looking for Mr. Goodbar. Um... I was disappointed. I had heard about it. Make sure to cover it up. Uh, the quality is very cheap as far as the packaging goes. All of them, it just has the little name and their store on it. Very, it's not very professional looking. And the other one was Eden Lake Uncut, you know, and it too is the same way you know just nothing but their store name it's like come on man five weeks and all that whatever so yeah i did finally get those in and quality wise though um it's very very it definitely is hd 1080p quality had no problems with it so that was that was good it looked beautiful i just you know as I suggested, I will only ever use that site if I am extremely desperate and, of course, know beforehand what I'm getting into and what I'm going to receive. They're not packaged beautifully. They don't even take the time to make a disc, to print a good disc. They just put their store name on it. It's just, as a, you know, for a collector, it's definitely a bottom of the barrel if you actually have no other choice is the way I'm going to do it. But let's, we can talk about that more later. So instead, let's talk about the movie, Looking for Mr. Goodbar. Now, uh, yes, yeah, so Looking for Mr. Goodbar is based on a true story. And um, it, the main aspects of the true story are very, are, are kept very, very close to the true story. The true story is of Roseanne Quinn, who was murdered in 1973. She was a school teacher, um, and that's a lot of what the, this movie is about, is the dichotomy. She was a very well-loved and very good school teacher, and um, she is murdered by this psycho closet case who does what closet cases do. And he ended up, you know, murdering her very horribly. And this is uh, based on the book that was based on that murder. So looking for Mr. Goodbar, uh, they do keep it very close to the actual story. There is some fictionalization and dramatization, of course. 
but it's pretty much the it's pretty much the real story. And this focuses on Diane Keaton. The movie was directed by Richard Brooks. It was written by Judith Rosner and Richard Brooks, who adapted it. Um, and it stars Diane Keaton, Richard Gere, Tuesday Weld, and uh, Tom Berenger, who plays the psycho closet case killer at the end. So, um, Diane Keaton plays Teresa Dunn. She, uh, when we start the movie, we get, you know, scenes of all of the cruising, um, late night New York bar scene, the single scene, the bar hopping. We get a lot of that. Um, we are introduced to her. She lives in a very, very strict Catholic family. She had a terrible um, incident. She was born with um, curvature of the spine and had to have surgery on it and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And it's congenital, so it's, you know, carried on in your kids. It's genetic. So she had that happen. She is uh, studying to be a teacher. She also begins an affair with her professor. Now, um... She is really affected by the women's liberation movement. And uh, basically, when it comes right down to it, she wanted to be, like a lot of women at that period did, she wanted equality, which means that... <laughs> okay, I'm going to talk crude, because that's the only way I know to say it. You know, the truth is often very crude, so you'll just have to deal with it. Um, if you know my channel, you know that that is a possibility when you come to watch one of my videos that I'm just going to tell it like it is. Basically, men have always been allowed to be promiscuous sluts. They can, you know, hump anything that moves and it's okay. Well, the women's liberation came along and they wanted equality and why not have equality in everything? And that includes your sexuality. So she was very affected by the women's liberation movement. Uh, the movie starts at the pretty much uh, right before New Year's of 1976. So you have, you know, the women's liberation movement. She doesn't want to be owned by a man. She wants to be able to explore her sexuality, to do whatever she wants to do in the same way that men do it, and yet women are looked down upon for doing the same thing. But she wasn't going to have it, so she was a very strong person, but like anyone who falls into that lifestyle, you are taking a lot of risk, um, and those risks have changed over time, but they are all still there, and there always have been. So... You know, she also has to deal with the fact that her sister is the favorite of the family. She's very good. She's she's out, but uh, according to her parents. But in actuality, her sister is way worse than she is. Um, dating married men, doing all kind of stuff, having abortions and everything behind the parents' back. And she, of course, knows all of this. And she is demanded to be the good girl. And uh, she finally does get her teaching certificate. I'm going to get completely lost in my notes because I'm just going right through it. So she has this affair. She discovers sex. And she is instantly, like, unsatisfied with this. He wasn't a very good lay. Um, he was quick and easy and had a lot of, issues himself so she unfortunately was introduced to sexuality by a person who wasn't very good at it is the truth and she was left very unsatisfied very both emotionally and more importantly physically for her she was left very unsatisfied she started having conflicts at home, looking at what her sister did, but yet she was not allowed to do. So she started being introduced to these things, a lot of which was by her sister. She would go over to her sister's house. Her sister was a swinger. Um, she saw nudity. She saw porn movies um, at her sister's house. Um, she even walked in on them in the bedroom having a, you know, swap 
swingers. Yeah, they were engaging in that. So she saw all of this while at the same time she was also introduced by Freedom because she finally got fed up, moved out of her house because her sister had married a guy who bought this apartment complex. So they offered her an apartment at half price. So Miss, Miss Liberation was free and clear to behave how she wanted to behave, to do what she wanted to do, and not be controlled by anyone any man, including a lover, a husband, or a father. Um, It was at this time and the, uh, you know, the influence of her sister that she also introduced herself to the bar scene, club scene. She was going around to clubs. She was dabbling in drinking. She was dabbling in smoking pot, which her sister introduced her to. Um... This continued. She found it all very fascinating to be free, like she had always seen men being free. So, but at the same time, this whole movie is about dichotomy. This good, wonderful, sweet, you know, school teacher with a dichotomy of a cruiser. I'm talking pure cruiser, swinger, cruiser. So, and, and, and that's another point that we'll make in this movie. So, she meets Richard Gere one night. Um, he plays Tony. And um, the first scene that we're introduced to him, they don't really hook up. But the next scene that they do, she takes him home. And um, this is a very infamous, it's a very infamous scene. It's one of Richard Gere's first movies. Um, and he was not afraid to pretty much show everything, which he did. And I've actually heard people say that not Richard Gere himself, but Richard Gere's ass in a jockstrap as he does that dance, you know, all around the room for 10 minutes and push-ups and that, that his, just his actual ass in that jockstrap should have got a Best Supporting Actor award. And... I can I, I I can agree with that to a certain extent. It was very well. The pause button is your friend is all I've got to say. But so we're introduced to him. He's basically a male prostitute, but not a but but a straight one. He's a straight male prostitute, so he services women for money. Um, but he never, like, asked her for money. Instead, it was, like, two wild people hooking up. He had his wild side. She had her wild side. Now, he introduced her to what that professor did not, which was explosive, exciting, long, drawn-out sexual satisfaction. And she pretty much became addicted to that side of her nature, while it not interfering in her other side. Because there are people who can do that. And it's okay if they do. As long as they don't let one side interfere with the other. Your nightlife interfere with your day life, so to speak. So she really did handle that role very well. She got her teaching license. She was a beloved teacher of deaf children. Um, She was wonderful at the job she the children loved her the school loved her everything where at the same time this wonderful proper beloved school teacher at come sundown was a very wild drinking smoking and sexually promiscuous individual tricking left and right with every man she could find and she did do a lot of that Now, um, in an effort to help one of her children, she meets James. One of her school kids is on welfare, can't get a hearing aid. Um, The man's going to, like, throw out the parents and cut off her schooling uh, because her mother is seeing a man, and, you know, you can't have a man if you're on welfare, and, you know, all that stuff living with you. So she goes and, like, kind of 
jumps his ass and tells him to bend the rules because this girl is so important to her. Um, he actually does do that. And the girl gets her own hearing aid. She becomes able to talk, things like that. We are also introduced to LeVar Burton, um, Geordi from Star Trek The Next Generation. This is one of his first movies besides Roots. You know, he went on to do Roots or had just done Roots. Yeah, he had already done Roots. So, you know, we're introduced to LeVar, you know, to LeVar Burton in this movie and he plays the little girl Amy's brother. So, as her lifestyle continues, she definitely, you know, does a real good job at keeping it separate from her good side, if you want to call it that. I'm not saying that her promiscuity was a bad thing, but there are risks involved, as we talked about. So you have to be mature enough to handle it. Now, she did screw up one time. She she was very, ooh, what are they doing? That, that was her main problem, I believe, is that she was always like, I'm this free bad girl. And whenever she would hear someone doing something or see the way someone was acting, she would go, oh, that's the way a bad girl acts. That's the way a swinger acts. That's the way, you know. So it's like... <laughs> And it was a funny scene because she saw a girl buying a dime bag of cocaine. And so she like went to the guy who had hooked up the girl, you know, over there on the other side of the bar. And this was a really funny scene because she goes up and says, hey, man, can you get me some of what you gave her? Just trying to be one of the crowd. Right? This is what you're supposed to do to be this party wild party girl. I can try everything. So he like says, sure. So he goes and tells the drug dealer. And the drug dealer meets her in the bathroom. She has no fucking idea what she's doing. And he's like and he's like, Here you go, you know, and there's this little aluminum foil dime bag. And he's like got a dime you know she actually pulls out a dime a 10 cent piece and hands it to him oh sure i've got a dime and he like looks at it and he looks at her and he's like for real really <laughs> so he just like grabs her purse he grabs out all of her money he takes out 10 bucks gives the rest of the money back in her purse and hands it to her and he's like a dime as in a 10 dollar bill and he puts it away, and he hands her the stuff, and he even, like, as he walks out the door, he, like, hands her, throws her dime back to her and said, here, in case you need to call, the, you know, in case you need to call a cab. <laughs> so, that's the kind of person she was in this movie. She was innocent, but yet not innocent. She was naive, but yet wild as fuck, and was just trying to try all of these wild things. So, um, she didn't even do it. She didn't even do the cocaine. Um, it was Tony that stopped back by at her house that night that he found it while she was taking a shower. He found it, and he accused her of being a junkie. You know, and she's like, I don't even know what you're talking about. And then he started talking about, you know, cocaine, cocaine. You know, and, and he opened it up, and she became really fascinated, right? Because she's like, oh, what is that? You know, and he's like, well, this is cocaine. And so he he showed her how to do it. You know, and she snorted a couple of lines. And she was flying like a kite. And then when he finally left to go do his business, you know, she was basically all hyped up, ready to party. And he was like, you can't go to work like that. So he then gives her a quaalude. You know, it's like, Unless you want to climb the wall, uh, the walls all night and not be functional at school tomorrow, you need to take this. So she learns about that as well because that shit knocks her out. She's late for school the next day. Um, she comes in, you know, horribly hungover, uh, tries to explain to the kids. And what's interesting, though, is that was the one and only time that that ever happened. It only took one lesson. That's how... That's how good at she was at keeping these two parts of her life separate. 
So she learned a lesson that night. Now, that didn't make her stop. She would still do cocaine and all that, but she knew when, where, and what not to do. So as she became more and more wild with it, her her relationship with James started falling apart because, to tell you the truth, he was just way too square for her. Um, Her dad and family liked him. Uh, That was, of course, she was rebellious. So if you like my boyfriend, I'm not going to like him. Um, he wasn't into, he wasn't very, he didn't have a very high libido, he wasn't trying to come on to her, and here she was out going and getting laid whenever she wants to, and this guy that likes her, you know, he hasn't even kissed her once, so there's a lot of clashing between these two, he tries to help her, wants to marry her, and she doesn't want any of that, as a matter of fact, she ends up going and getting um, either, I don't, I don't think she got a hysterectomy. I think she got her tubes tied after her sister got pregnant once again and had an abortion. Um, uh, cause she did have some kids. The sister had two or three kids, but she had an abortion and you saw Teresa. She went to the doctor and had him make sure she never got pregnant considering her lifestyle. Um, but that's not reason. She didn't get an uh, she didn't get her tubes tied because she wanted to be a hoe. She got her tubes tied because she had congenital spinal bifida or whatever that is, and did not want to pass it on to any children because of the way she suffered. Because I've heard a lot of people say she just wanted to be a hoe and not get pregnant. I'm like, no. She makes it very clear in the movie that she did not want to pass on this genetic defect. She did not want to risk having a child with a with a curvature of the spine to go through the horror that she went through. So, um, her life continues to spiral in that way. She is partying, drinking, um, but she's very successful in her thing. But the problem with it isn't the lifestyle. The problem was her naivete with who she meets up with and not knowing the extents that they will go to she's living the lifestyle but she doesn't know the lifestyle she ends up finally pissing tony off to the point where tony swatted her she's in the shower cops break in the door they search her house because tony knew you know she was through with him so he got her even with her by swatting her she got arrested. Her secrets were known. She splashed on the paper. She was fired from school. Um, she, so she lost her job and everything. Now, um, James, he still came back. He still wanted to help. He still wanted to marry. She's totally not about it, though. And they end up having a very uncomfortable scene where they do finally engage in it. And she had never seen a condom before. So she started hilariously laughing at him and things like that, which she apologized for. But she was just like, I've never seen one of these things, you know, and um, which I guess shows you, you know, I mean, her lifestyle obviously involved a whole lot of bareback horseback riding, if you know what I'm saying. So, because she had never even seen a condom. So, that hurt him, but at the same time, not really, but he left. However, now, after all of this stuff has happened to her, she basically had decided to chill out, which is unfortunate. She had decided to chill out, she went partying one last night and uh, was making the rounds at her favorite bar. And unbeknownst to her, this guy, played by Tom Berenger, he had had a fight with his boyfriend because he is a closet case. He's got a wife down in Georgia or something, then he keeps running for it. He has a very hard time. He has a lot of anger and rage towards women. Um, A lot of the issues that closet case people have. So 
she was nice to him at the club that night because James showed up. And so she went and talked to this guy like, hey, you know, if you pretend to be talking to me, chatting me up, um, this guy will go away and leave me alone. Now, what's sad about it is this was the last night that she was going to do all this kind of partying. She was going to, you know, go, you know, she was going to kind of chill down. So this guy, did, you know, did that favor for her and let her chat, you know, pretended to chat her up and stuff. And this is exactly one year from the when the movie started because it's New Year's Eve of 1977. So, well, New Year's Eve, 1976. It's becoming 1977. So he goes back with her to her apartment and he starts trying to come on to her a little bit because she wasn't even going to let him stay. You know, she says, well, you can have one drink. But he was out on the streets. He needed a place to stay. And because of his experiences, he thought that that meant you got to put out to spread out. <laughs> so he starts trying to get it on. And she reciprocated because that was her that was her gig anyway. So he was very good looking. So it's like, oh, hell yeah, let's go. Well, of course it don't work. And you know what I mean by it. It don't work. He, he can't perform. He can't get it up. She even was like pretty nice about it and was just like, it's okay. It's no big deal. But he took everything that she said wrong. You know, you know, and she's like, you don't have to prove anything to me. Oh, well, what do you think I'm trying to prove? Well, see, we all know what his issue was, but she didn't know a damn thing. So he finally lost it. Just like in the real life story. He lost it. He beat her up. Threw her all around the room. Um, began to rape her. And um, she actually responded to that by, yeah, you know. It, it was a very difficult scene to watch because she's being horribly attacked and yet her response to it is just like rough sex you know um because she had had that before too and she was kind of into it so she like the fact it's hard to explain because it's youtube <laughs> but she actually was like you know yeah give it to me give it to me oh and he reached over there and he picked up a butcher knife and at the same time he's stabbing her, he's also stabbing her, if you know what I mean. And that is a god-awful scene. And it's all done in strobe light, you know? So, and the blood and, the, and, and all of that. And then the strobe lights start mimicking her dying breaths, you know? So every breath she took, there would be a strobe. That's a very, that's a very well-known cinematic scene from in in filmdom, and cinephiles is uh, the end of looking for Mr. Goodbar. Um, so there's a black strobe light every time she's taking a breath, and the strobes get slower. <sighs> until it's gone and so the credits start rolling now in real life the guy was caught um what was his name john wayne wilson he was caught in real life um as a matter of fact it was a guy that he was scamming you know who didn't know and fell for him and then found out he was a closet case and then found out he had a wife and all of that but because he had already fallen for him he made the mistake that a lot of gay men and gay women do and that is that when they find that out they've already fallen for that person so they want to help them they want to help them through it and stuff like that and 
he kind of blamed himself because he knew the dude was like had issues but when he realized what had happened he saw it i believe he saw it in the paper because the guy came and told him what he had done and then fled back to where he came from but the guy thought he was just being hurtful you know to him so he didn't believe it at first until he saw the news reports of Teresa, uh, uh, I mean, Roseanne Quinn. When he saw the news reports, that's when he was like, oh my God. And he, he called the police and turned him in. So, you know, he didn't try to hide it. He just didn't believe it at first until he found out. And I guess that taught him a lesson. And politically correct or not I would never go anywhere near a closet case in my life okay I'm sorry if that offends you um, but there is no person fence jumping or switch hitting coming anywhere around me in my life I'm just not having it I'm not dealing with that so yes that's looking for Mr. Goodbar the cast was fantastic Diane Keaton was absolutely amazing. Richard Gere was amazing as Tony. Um, Tom Berenger played that killer really well. And yeah, there you go. That is Looking for Mr. Goodbar from 1977, based on the true life events of the murder of Roseanne Quinn. Looking for Mr. Goodbar. And I will see you in the next thing that I do. I love this movie. It is a 9 out of 10 to me. I don't know. Maybe it should be a 10 out of 10. It could be a 10 out of 10. I'll think about it. We'll see. 9.5 out of 10. It's very good. It's a wonderful movie. I'm very, very glad to have it in my collection finally. And, uh, yeah, I will see you in the next thing that I do. Love you, miss you, bye. Always remember, never forget, you're a very, very special person, no matter what anybody tells you. And um, one more thing. I think one of the biggest points of this movie is that personal lives and public lives you know, you can be, I think that's what this movie was trying to say, you know, you can be an absolutely wonderful, beloved, kind, helpful, wonderful person, and still have things that other people think bad of you about. So, people accusing her of being a slut, being a bad person. Um, she didn't hurt anyone. She got hurt. You know. And the success of her public life as a school teacher and all of that, her private business was her private business. And if she wanted to go and bar hop and swing and stuff like that I personally am not into that kind of stuff but that's fine if that's what she wants to do I just wish that the real person I wish that she had you know been a little bit more safe with that behavior I don't think you should engage in any lifestyle or behavior without fully educating yourself on the possibilities and the dangers and how to protect yourself from it. She did not deserve it. And she did nothing wrong. She was her own person. She didn't do anything to harm anyone. And she had led a very productive, contributing, contributing. She contributed very much to the, those children's lives as a teacher. And she didn't deserve what happened to her. And this movie, especially the final act, is one of the best you know movies ever made. 
and it says a lot. And that is one of the most awful anxiety-inducing kill scenes that you will ever run across is her murder at the end. So I will see you in the next thing that I do. Love you, miss you. Bye-bye. I always remember to never forget you're a very special person. I know I already did that, but I forgot the closing line, which is even if you are an angel in public, and a slut at night. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye.